own picture, Sister Sarah. But the shepherd has a better point of view and he can see all things. He knows where we're at. We're not lost. Amen. Everybody look at your neighbor and say, I'm not lost. I just don't know where I'm at. Huh? You know, sometimes that's the way it is. We're not lost. We just don't know where we are. We think we do. I think we know exactly where we're at. Sometimes, and then sometimes we wake up in a new world because it's not the way we went to sleep. Different. I want to I want to draw your attention tonight to Nehemiah chapter one verse one. And I may not pronounce all these words right, but bear with me. If you know them better than me, that's okay. You can tell me what they are. You ready to go home or something? The words of Nehemiah the son of Hachaliah, and it came to pass in the month. Cheslu in the 20th year, as I was in Shishan the palace, that Hank and I, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. I want y'all to notice what he says. Said, Lord, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive and thy eyes open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now day and night for the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel which we have sinned against thee, both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against thee and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments which thou commandest thy servant Moses. Remember, I beseech thee the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If you transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But if you turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though there were a few cast out into the uttermost part of the heaven, yet will I gather them from thence and will bring them into the place that I have chosen to set my name there. Now these are thy servants and thy people whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive, attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name and prosper. I pray thee, thy servant, this day and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. I want to use this for a thought tonight. The joy of the Lord is your strength. You may be seated. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Does anybody know where that's found? That sounds like a song, doesn't it? <laughs> Nehemiah 8 and 10, the last part of it says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Ring. Wow. The joy of the Lord. Have you thought about that? The joy of the Lord. I've heard people talk about that verse. 
Uh, and, I, and I've heard preachers preach about it saying that when you don't have strength, God has plenty of strength and it gives him joy to give you the strength that you need. I heard others preach that God is full of joy, so your joy should rest on God's joy. Still others say that it means when you find God, you find joy and happiness because God is essentially a blessed and happy God. But you know, I, I got to thinking about it today and I, I, I just maybe want to bring out something a little bit different. I think the joy of the Lord is to see God smile about the great things that his children are doing. That's the joy of the Lord. And it's our strength when we know that God is smiling. It's our strength when we know that God is pleased. It's our strength when we leave here and know that we have fulfilled the will of God for this service. To see God getting glory. That's, my, that, that's our strength, isn't it? To see God getting glory. The joy of God. That's my strength. Just think about what our mission is. Saving people, right? That gives God joy. That makes Him rejoice when we bring people to church and they come to an altar and we pray with them and they come to an altar and they ask God to forgive give them of their sins. Matter of fact, heaven rejoices. Amen. So let me ask you, do, do you think when God's people are in distress like in this text and, and the gates are burned and the walls are torn down, do you think that makes God happy? No, it doesn't, does it? So what makes Him happy? What gives God joy? God is most glorified when we are fulfilling His purpose. When we are doing what God wants us to do, that makes God happy. I think Paul makes it clear in Ephesians chapters 1, 2, and 3. God's purpose involves building His church for the sake of His name or for His glory. He wants to display the riches of His glorious grace and His manifold wisdom through the church to all the angelic host of heaven and to all the unbelievers in the world. God wants to reveal His glory. God wants to reveal His mercy. He wants to reveal His grace to the whole world. The truth is that this, this really should be a life-transforming truth. God's glory and His people's joy in Him fit together. God's aim in creating the world was to display the value of His glory by an ever-increasing joy of His people in that glory. We need to understand that the greatest joy of God is a human soul who is doing the will of God. Because that really makes God happy, doesn't it? When we do His will. You understand that this book of Nehemiah is really about Nehemiah doing God's will. It's really about getting a burden and doing something for God. And then God is joyful. I mean, he He's just ecstatic because... We're actually doing something that's going to please Him, that's going to cause His glory to show. Let me go back and say this. There is more to serving God than just talking about God. Amen. God wants to use each one of us for His glory. But He also wants to develop us into people who are more usable to Him. In our text, Nehemiah was serving as a cupbearer to King Artaxerxes. And verse 2 tells us that his brother and some other men of Judah had just come from Jerusalem. And Nehemiah inquired about the condition of the city and the people. 
And they told him the remnant of, of those there who survived, who survived the captivity are in great distress and reproach. And the wall is broken down and the gates are burned with fire. Y'all, this wasn't anything new to Nehemiah. It, it was a known fact already that the walls and gates had been destroyed for over 140 years. But you know, sometimes when you hear something, it actually does something to you. You've heard it before. This first-hand news about the walls and gates caused Nehemiah concern. Sometimes, y'all, we know situations are bad. And we do nothing, right? And sometimes we know situations are bad. And it just hits us different and we start trying to do something. Right? Now, I don't understand what happens, but I, 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 it, it's got to be God. It's got to be a God thing. There's no doubt. There's no doubt will come a time... Uh, that things are going to bother us. I, I don't understand how it works, but uh, people can drive through cities. Uh, they can drive through countries with no Pentecostal church and don't feel anything, no unction. Don't feel, hear God speak to them or anything. No voice from God. Just, just drive through it knowing there's no church and nothing. Then all of a sudden one day, you start weeping for that town that you drove to. How does that happen? You know, you, you think about that. Uh, why is it we're concerned, you know, for, for our families? We know their lost condition, but yet we don't have a burden for them. How could that be? We know they're lost, but yet we don't have a burden. But then all of a sudden, we wake up one morning or... I don't know what happens, but all of a sudden we get a burden for them. And we start weeping and mourning and fasting and we can't sleep because we're concerned about them. God has a perfect time for all things, including you. Including your family. Including your friends. Including cities. Including countries. God's been wanting to do something maybe for a long time, but maybe we haven't been ready to do anything. Maybe we're not in a position to do anything. And now all of a sudden, God has changed the position, and now we're ready, and God is ready, and things start working together. Here's the deal. Nehemiah saw the need, and the need burdened his heart. And he knew what God wanted to do, but he had to commit himself to do it. Listen to me. The person that God uses to bring him joy has to have a burden. Amen. You may be like Nehemiah. You've, you've known about the situation for a long time. But then it's like all of a sudden you really hear it for the first time. Sometimes we know about things and we can put it out of our minds. But then there are those things that you can't quit thinking about. Nehemiah heard this news. The Bible says he wept, he mourned, and he fasted. And when you look it up from verse 1 uh, of chapter 1 to, to verse uh, 1 of chapter 2, uh, it's been four months of praying and mourning and weeping. And fasting. This wasn't no fly by night thing. This, this was, he knew that this was a serious matter that needed attention. He had to have a burden. And he got that burden from the Lord. And he didn't immediately go rushing into uh, to the king and say, King, sorry, buddy, I, I let you and everything, but, but I've got to go build a wall in Jerusalem. You know, the, the, the guys, my brother just came in there and told me how bad Jerusalem was, and, and I've got to go restore it. I've got to go build the walls and the gates back, and I've, I've got to save the people. And he waited on God. You know, sometimes we need to wait on the Lord. We need to wait for the opportunity that God has. 
And he waited on God. And God gave him opportunity to talk to the king at the right time. And when he talked to the king, the king gave him everything that he needed. Think about this. I'm, I'm sure that there had been other people who had heard about the walls and about the gates being burned. They probably said, man, I, I, I hate to hear that. We say that a lot of times. Well, I sure hate that. Yes. Oh, that's terrible news. And then they go right back to work or right back to doing whatever they were doing because they were not burdened by the need to do something about it. But the man that God used not only heard about it, he felt the need, he wept, he mourned, he fasted, and he prayed about it for days and months. You know, I get people all the time who say, please pray for my situation, or pray for my son, or pray for my family. And they haven't even fasted one meal about it. Huh? They, they might have not even mourned about it. They, they might not have even cried about it. And I know sometimes the need is so great that we think, I, I can't possibly do anything about it. My hands are tied. I, I can't do anything about this situation. Well, first let me say this. Don't let the intensity of the need paralyze you so much that you do nothing. Yes. Amen? Amen. We say, I can't feed all the hungry. I can't clothe all the poor. I can't supply everybody's need. No, you can't. But you can start somewhere. Yes. Come on. Matthew 9, 36 through 38 says, talks about Jesus seeing the multitude. He was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Verse 37, then said he unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but what? The laborers are few. 38, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Listen to me. Don't you think every time that we get a burden for the lost, God gets joy? Yes. Every time we decide to do something to save the world, God gets joy. The joy of God smiling is our strength. Amen. The joy of God being pleased with us should be our strength. The joy of God smiling when we pick up people for church and we feed the hungry or witness, that is our strength because we know that we are pleasing God. Nehemiah knew that he was pleasing God by going to Jerusalem. I believe everything or every time the church gets a burden for souls and and works on winning people for him that God smiles. He gets joy. He gets uh, joy every time a sinner turns away from sin. In fact, all of heaven rejoices and God gets the glory. So let me go back here for a minute. First of all, if the need is so great and overwhelming, don't get paralyzed and do nothing. Second, don't commit yourself just because there's a need. It needs to be that you have a burden for the lost. It needs to be that you have a burden to feed the poor. Come on. Yes. You cannot respond to all the world's needs. Nobody can. But we must wait on God in prayer until He burdens our heart with a particular need that we can do something about. Nehemiah got burdened because he saw the people's great need and he prayed and sought God and he fasted and wept and he knew that he could do something about it. Amen. We might not have all the things that we need, but he knew that he could do something about it. He was in position. He had never been in position before, maybe, to do what he could do now. But now he's the cupbearer. He's the king's right hand man. He had to taste the wine. He had to taste everything that the king was going to eat. He, he was in position that he had to, he was the king's right hand man. And he knew that if I, I'm in this position, that if my people are in trouble, 
that I know that I can get help from the king and I know I can get help from God. But y'all, that's not all. He also had a need, he had a burden because of the people's great sin. Y'all realize that we have a burden because of the world's great sin. Nehemiah realized that there was a greater need than just walls and gates or lack of leadership or, or even uh, organization that he could get everybody organized. They definitely needed to be organized, but, but the root of the problem was not the lack of resources or organizational skills. The root of the problem was sin. So he prayed, Nehemiah 1 and 6, Lord, I pray and confess the sins of the children of Israel. You know what we need to do sometimes? We just need to pray and talk to the Lord and say, God, I realize the sins of this world. I realize that we have aborted all of these babies, Sister Vonda. <coughs> and we need to ask for forgiveness, Lord. We have sinned and sinned greatly. He said, both I and my father's house have sinned. Verse 7, we haven't kept your commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments which thou command thy servant Moses. Y'all realize that's what's wrong with our world is we are sinners. We haven't kept God's commandments. You know why there's terrorist attack? Because of sin. That's right. You know why this, uh, our government is so full of greed and corruption? It's sin. Yes. You know why there's famine and disease? It's sin. God help us to realize that we are living in a world of sin. And Lord, every day we need to pray and ask you to help us, Lord, to save our world. Boy, look at it. It's overwhelming, isn't it? I can't do it all by myself. What about starting in your family? Huh? What about starting in your church? Oh yeah, come on. Um, Y'all, I, I gotta tell you, you look at our world, the reason married couples can't get along is because of sin. You, they're sin. Why do kids rebel against their parents? It's sin. Either from the beginning of Adam and Eve or else now we, we don't obey our parents. You know, there's all kinds of reasons why we sin. But we need to stay focused. The problem is human sin. And when we get people to come to God, God says, that's exactly what I've been wanting. I've been wanting them to repent of their sins. I've been wanting to have a relationship with them. And now you've brought them to me. And God is joyful. He gets joy. And we get strength, don't we, when we see those come to the altar and repent. Yes. But we get so... Unfocused, don't we? Wow, we just... God has shown us mercy and saved us. Nothing could give him more joy than that we, we would go to a sinner and tell them that God wants to offer them his mercy and forgiveness just like he offered it to us. But if we start thinking, thinking that the real need is, well, we, we really need to get better organized before we go out and invite people to church. And we're guilty of that, aren't we? We need more funds. We need better buildings. Y'all, let me tell you, the real need is still repentance. Yes. Amen. We have forgotten His purpose and are living for our own purpose instead of God's purpose. Nehemiah's burden stemmed from feeling the people's great need. Here's a question. What does it mean if we, if we don't have a burden for lost people? Think about that. What does it mean if we don't have a burden? I think it means that we've become so caught up in our own stuff that we don't have time to let God work through us anymore. Amen. We're, we're so caught up in our stuff and seeking our stuff. We, we don't have time to seek for God's kingdom and God's purpose. 
Matthew tells us, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. God did not save us so that we could live the American dream and travel the world in a motor home and go to all the national parks. No. <laughs> Sounds like fun, don't it? Yeah. <laughs> he saved us so that we, he could use us to further his purpose. Amen. So that brings me to something else. First, the person God uses has a burden for his people. And secondly, the person God uses has a vision for his purpose. Amen. Nehemiah knew something about what God wanted to do with his people. Look at verse 9. But if you turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though there were a few cast out into the uttermost part of the heaven, everybody say they were scattered. They were scattered. Yet I will gather them from thence and will bring them into the place that I have chosen to set my name there. Nehemiah knew God wanted his people in Jerusalem. They were scattered. Some had been in Babylon for over a hundred years. But God's purpose involved his name or his glory being made known in Jerusalem. Let me, let me just let y'all in on a little secret here. And I'll tell you this, and I've never told you this before. It's not just about us. That's right. Right? It's about Him. It's about His name. It's about His church. It's about His people. And man, do you know that, that in this age, God's purpose involves the church? And Jesus said in Matthew 16, 16 18, I will build my church. Hold it. Wait. What did that say? He said, I will build my church. Amen. He wants a church. Amen. He desires to have a church. Everybody look at it and say this. He's going to have a church. He's going to have a church. Amen. He's going to have a church. He, it's all about his glory. It's all about his name. Amen. Revelation 5, 9 says that Jesus purchased for God with his own blood man from every child, tongue, people, and nation. But why, why does he want to save people from all over the world? God's purpose involves building a church for his name's sake. Wow. The reason God uses us is he wants us to get committed to his purpose and his purpose is to save the world and if he saves the world that's going to be joyful to him people are going to be called by his name he's going to get glory for Nehemiah didn't hear about the walls and gates and say, well, that's, that's too bad. I wish somebody could do something. I hope somebody does something. I, I hope, you know, but all of a sudden, Nehemiah got the burden itself. He was willing to count the world as lost for the sake of God's purpose. I'm laying aside what I want to do for God's purpose. I'm laying aside what I want to do because God's purpose is much greater than my purpose. Y'all, Nehemiah had a great job. Mm. What if God must have asked us to lay aside our job? And I know I'm going over time here. What if God asked us to lay aside our job and all of a sudden go to the mission field? Huh? People have been known to do that. When you think about his job, he, he, I mean, he had it made. He was in the palace. His walls and, and floors were, were uh, cedar covered in gold and silver and ivory. Nehemiah ate the best food. He wore the best clothes, lived in a very comfortable quarters. He had, he had been put in the king's service. He was not free to leave. It was, it was a good job. He was supposed to stay there with the king. But now he hears about the distress of God's people and, and, and the dishonor of God's name and he's willing to give it all up to save God's name. Wow. Don't you know that must have made God happy 
when somebody gives it all up just to save God's name? Who would give all of that up so God could have his name honored again in Jerusalem? So that God could again be praised and worshipped in Jerusalem. Who, who would give up their lifestyle for that? We heard a missionary talking Sunday about people. There's only two apostolic Pentecostal churches in Poland. And one family had to drive five and a half hours to go to church. Well, who would do a thing like that? Don't you know that makes God smile when people get up and drive five and a half hours to go to church? Oh, wait. Man, I, yeah, I drive five and a half hours to watch the Cardinals and, or watch the Atlanta Braves. Or five and a half hours to go to church. Hmm. I'll, I'll drive five and a half hours to go. Y'all realize that there's people who work in Washington, D.C., that in order to get home, it takes like two and a half to three hours to get home every day. And yet they go to that job. But who would, who would drive five and a half hours to go to church? Who, who would drive five and sacrifice five and a half hours when you think about it? Round trip, y'all, 11 hours. They put in a day to go to church. Wow. Talk about a sacrifice. Don't you know that has to make God so happy to see people so in love with Him that they would drive five and a half hours to go to church? Wow. Let me just challenge you tonight. Don't throw your life away on the American dream of financial security or early retirement, spend your life for the only purpose that matters, to see the nations glorify God for His great mercy. Y'all, we have the greatest thing going tonight right here. We get to come together and worship God. Amen. The greatest thing we can do the thing that will make God happy tonight is for us to worship Him and to get somebody saved in this place tonight. To somebody, have somebody to get a greater desire to serve the Lord tonight. Somebody to please God. Ask God for a burden. Ask God for a vision. Ask God for His purpose. And get a commitment to do God's will. That's what gives God joy. Knowing that you are pleasing Him should give you strength tonight. Should give you enough strength to go through tomorrow. Knowing that you are pleasing God with your testimony, with your walk with Him, when you're talking with Him every day, and you're talking to somebody about God every day, that is giving God joy. Let's stand. The joy of the Lord is my strength. We got it all wrong. If mama's happy, everything's okay. Mama ain't happy, nobody's happy. It ain't about mama. It's about God. What makes him happy? What makes God have joy? When we fulfill his purpose. When we win the lost. When we worship him. It's about his name. It's about giving glory to God. Hallelujah. Lord bless you. Thank you for being in this service. I'm sorry I kept you for six minutes over time tonight. Um, Sunday morning service, bring somebody with you to the house of the Lord. And let's have a good time in God's house. Amen. Any other announcements I need to make? You're dismissed in Jesus' name.